Minasan, Konichiwa, Otashiwa, Andrea, Antonello, Italia Kara, Kimashta, Kyo, Komasho de Inasamani, Open Source GIS, Nitsuite, Ohana Shira Kirukoto, Oresku Omoima. Okay, so my Japanese is quite good, but I will be speaking English from now on, okay? <laughs> this is very important to me because at the end of a presentation, if there are different languages, people are afraid to ask questions just maybe because their English is not good. So I made myself miserable doing Japanese, <laughs> so you won't be afraid to ask me afterwards. Okay, so. Uh, this needs to be switched on. <laughs> ah, so. yeah. Okay, who am I? He already told, but I didn't understand, so I will repeat maybe some stuff. I am co-founder with Silvia, you've seen her before, uh, of this small, small company. In Italy, it's called Hydrologist, and we are uh, kind of like the Fosco-G here in Osaka. We exist 10 years now. So we do only open source GIS development. And I do also research at the University of Bolzano. And in the OSJ world, I'm uh, in the steering committee and do development of UDIG. Uh, mostly the spatial toolbox and JGRAS tools. Uh, we also developed uh, some plugins for UDIG to do digital field mapping. So you take your uh, tablet and go out in the field mapping. Obviously, this project stopped being developed at that time in which mobile phones and tablets came with Android. So the project I'm now supporting, develop, and coordinate is GeoPaparazzi. Uh, this presentation wants to be a bit more generic about how did we get to GeoPaparazzi. So how was the history? First of all, I think we should go back and have a look at history, not so much of Android or whatever it is, but really on mobile. So what happened back in the days? In 1991, mobile market penetration was 0.4%. Penetration means, for those that maybe don't understand it, 100% uh, penetration means every inhabitant has a mobile phone and an active line. In 91, it was 0.4% worldwide. Sweden was very forward with 6.6%. 6 2010, we had a 91.1 percentage of mobile market penetration. In 2002, Luxembourg reached already 100%. Every inhabitant had at least an active line. And it's interesting because mobile was first used by businessmen. So maybe we understand why Luxembourg, which is a very particular economical situation, reached first the mobile penetration of 100%. In 2011, we had already 105 countries worldwide with a mobile uh, penetration that had more activations than inhabitants. In 2010, in Saudi Arabia, we had almost two active lines per inhabitants, whereas in the United States, we were still at 90% of penetration. In India, in 2011, India woke up and had as many or more activations than Europe, Russia, and Arabia together. And this brought an obvious consequence the internet traffic increased incredibly since we have smartphones and tablets and are basically always online. What about the coverage? Where can we surf? In 2003, the world coverage was 61%. In 2010, about 90%. Talking about SMS, you now all use WhatsApp 
which is the what is called OTD, over the top SMS. Back in 2000, we had 70 million worldwide of SMS. This got 250 milliards one year later, and it got doubled three years later, and it got four times as much in the next three years. And then in 2011, we started to have also a ton of web messages, like WhatsApp, Telegram. And it is guessed that around 2013, the quantity of web messages has been more or larger than the SMS, actual SMS. Just to give a very quick idea of, we said there is a lot of coverage, but there is still kind of a big digital divide between developed countries and developing countries. As you can see here, oh, okay, anyways, um, we have globally a high activation, active lines, many active lines, broadband lines, but in developing countries, it's 8% against 51% in developed countries. So there is still a quite high digital divide. This has to be considered. And one other very important factor is how much trash does this cost? Because I've seen uh, myself, I developing on, on, on smartphones, I change tablet and smartphone maybe once a year. But this means, I mean, I sell my smartphone to my mother, so I don't produce any trash. But lots of people throw away <laughs> the smartphone. So this is just, I found on your report about USA, uh, of the Environmental Protection Agency. In 2010, we had um, 64, uh, 46 millions of computers, so normal computers, and 235 uh, millions of uh, smartphone devices, mobile devices. The same year, the trash produced, have a look, is about half of it, which is really something to be considered and to be aware of, at least. The next thing I would like to talk about is, do you remember how it all started? Because when I try to look back at some point, somehow you forget how difficult it was at some point, because now you're always online and you can, any application works on your tablet. It's really very powerful right now. But 1973, the year I was born, it was quite different. This is the year in which we make contact, because after long years of research and competition with, between Motorola and Bell Labs, Motorola finally made the first prototype of what would be a mobile phone. And the 3rd of April, Mr. Martin Cooper makes his nice joke and makes the first known mobile cell phone call. And he called, obviously, Engel of Bell Labs to kid on him that he was faster than Engel. At that point, the phone was about one and a half kilogram. It was 23 centimeters long and took 10 hours to charge for 30 minutes of communication. <laughs> this was the first one and it took several years before the mobile phone could be really commercialized. In 1983, the first is the Dynatech 8000X. It is the first cell phone that was commercially available, and obviously it is businessmen that, that first were able to buy it and that needed it to be, stay connected. Another interesting point that I will always put in a corner is movies kind of reflect what's happening. So a few years later, Michael Douglas in Wall Street shows how cool it is to have a cell phone. In 19, only four years later, 1987, a very important mobile company comes into the game and creates the Nokia Mobira Cityman. It's also known as the Gorba. 
because it, it gained notoriety when my, Mikhail Gorbachev in Helsinki at a meeting called his communication ministry with this phone. And this really got a very important moment for the Gorba phone. So we come, things go on, and in 1993, the first, that what could be called the first smartphone uh, was produced. It was the IBM Simon. It appeared only two years later in the movie The Net. And it had a touch screen. In the same year, uh, another important thing happens. The first PDA appears. PDAs, the personal digital assistant, seem to be the real future. Actually, it's, it hasn't been like that. I, I bought one, or I asked Sylvia to buy me one, because she's the one handling the money in our company. I would buy every widget I find around otherwise. But I bought one, and after a few years, the PDAs were like put aside from what will be tablet and smartphones. 1996, we start to think about design on phones. This is the first phone, the Motorola StarTac, is obviously to recall the Star Trek. It's the same, the first flip phone. And it was also the first phone that brought this trend of having nice phones that have some design on them. The Nokia communicator, which was really the first smartphone, it could also so, uh, send fax. You most probably remember that phone. And it appears in the movie The Sand, in 19, one year later. In 1999, a very important phone for the Matrix, it is this flip phone, the Nokia 8110, and it's the first phone that supports the WAP protocol and was therefore able to browse the internet. That's a very important moment. In 2000, several <laughs> came to the game. <laughs> ah, you owned it, huh? <laughs> you look like you owned it. <laughs> uh, so many, many cell phones are produced. In this year, the first cell phone with a camera is produced by Sharp. Samsung produces the first MP3 player based one and Nokia comes out with the T9 correction and the uh, first integrated antenna. It's also supposed to be the strongest phone around. I, I, in Facebook you, you see people making jokes about throwing it and there is a house and the house breaks down, something like that. So a lot of variety starts to come onto the market. In 2007, the Nokia brings the N95. It's really a monster phone. I owned it because I promised I would develop an application for that phone with GPS because it had GPS, Wi-Fi, accelerometer. It had tons, tons of future. But this is also the last Nokia phone I owned because it was a phone that was no longer competitor with what would come out the same year. That year, Apple, uh, Apple breaks the market with the iPhone, a phone that would be really a smartphone, beautiful, everybody would love it, and you can have music on it, internet on it, whatever. People camped for 100 hours outside the Apple store. It seems like they are doing it still. I don't know why, but anyway. In the same year, uh, or two years earlier, Google buys a company, a small company called Android. And in 2007, the Open Handset Alliance is founded. It's a bunch of huge companies that are going to define standards for the mobile devices. And in 2008, finally, the first Android-based device comes out. It's the a HTC Dream and just to have an idea in 2010 the first Windows Mobile 7 phone based phone was released. So 
Microsoft was not really believing in this market at that time, and they, are, they were really a bit lagging a bit behind. On this phone, Joe Paparazzi was developed first. Uh, the mobile shares at that point, and in the years later, started to be all of Apple and Android, while Symbian, that had been the base of all the operating systems, mobile operating system, until that point started to slowly go down. Um, so how does this relate to the geographical free and open source world? Until that point, there was only one myth existing. I know it's not a myth because I saw it, Marcus showed it to me, but this device was a prototype and stayed like that. It was never really usable. It was just to be, hey, look what we have, but who else would have it? Several years later, a quite nice mobile application from the GVSIG community came out. It's the GVSIG Mobile, not the GVSIG Mini. It's the GVSIG Mobile. It had support for editing and a tons of features. You could even see ECW rasters on that device. And you could create forms. It had only one huge problem. It was built on an operating system called Windows Mobile, which even wasn't an operating system. It was some dirty stuff that was dying. So they made a lot of effort to create this application, but then it was kind of thrown away. Because at that point, Android had already taken over. Uh, a couple of, of projects, maybe you use a lot of QGIS, there is a QGIS mobile version for Android, and it's in my opinion, not exactly the right thing to do. I prefer to have a very lightweight situation for the mobile and for the mobile world and import my stuff and export my stuff from and to GIS. I don't want to have the whole GIS in the mobile. But anyways, this is it. And then there is another one, it's GVSIG Mini, but it's not a port of the GVSIG Mobile. This has very limited capabilities and it's more for touristic use. I won't go on with this. There is a nice page on the OpenStreetMap wiki that lists all the Android applications that make use of OpenStreetMap. So now the moment comes for a real mobile application, which is Geo Paparazzi. How, how, get, how Geo Paparazzi gets born? We are, Hydrologist is an engineering company, basically, and we developed Joe Paparazzi, first of all, for ourselves. So as you can see, when we do river mapping, we take this very nice bike. I have to, and Sylvia takes the points with the <laughs> bike. You see, it's exactly that way. Because at some point, you go for a survey, or do you do a professional talk or meeting, you very often you have to do also a very small uh, survey that doesn't need to be very precise maybe. So you don't have this big stuff. Or you could be in situations where you don't think you will have to do a survey, but then you have. So having the, the survey tool in your pocket always, that was the plan. And it worked. With Android it started to work because we always have our survey tool in the pocket. So in few words, what Joe Paparazzi is, for those that do not know, it's, oh, I think I went. It's just a very, very simple tool with which you can take notes. There can be text notes or pictures, or you can draw sketches, and it will place you, it will geo-refer it for you on the map. And you can also take GPS logs, and it will create the track and put it on the, on the map for you. You can have several background data, from vector special light in that case, to raster data to use as a background, and you can also create yourself your very professional set of data. Um, so the formats that are right now supported are this MapForge offline 
map files that are vector data, so you can take a whole country and bring it onto uh, Japan. I downloaded it when, before I came here. It's one gigabyte, and you have whole of Japan in one file on your phone. Fantastic. You can have MB tiles offline maps, and then you can also, through uh, small configuration files, you can also load WMS. What happens is it takes the WMS, if it doesn't have the data, it will put it inside, a, it will create an MB tiles database, it will put there the tiles, and then you can use them afterwards offline. So it will cache the data for you also. You can take notes. This is one of the important parts. And recently in Jabaparazzi, late three and the newest four, you have the possibility also to zoom to re-edit the points. And it's, it's quite simple to navigate through your notes. Um, one thing I put in this presentation, for those that started to use Jopaparazzi 4 and were wondering where all the tools are, you have to long tap on the menu icon and it will open the tool. If you short tap, it will open the context menu in which you can access the two different types of data. One type of data is the one that you prepare at home and use as background. The other is the one you really go out and survey, so your notes, your tracks, your whatever. So the upper part gives you the possibility to style and to see the profile of your GPS tracks, while the other one is really layers of special light databases. Java Barazzi 4 brings a very important feature that has been paid by the Research Foundation for State University of New York. We were very happy of this contribution. So they paid us to implement the polygon editing. So now you can load a special light database with polygons and you have some functionality <laughs> to edit it, edit its attributes as if you were working with a shapefile, but very simple. What you can do, you push the yellow button, it will once you define the layer to edit, it will open up a toolbar of what you can do. And any time you select a tool, for example the selection tool, the toolbar will change and will tell you what you can do with that tool. So once you select, you can then look at the attributes or remove a feature, for example. Or if you choose to create a new polygon, it will open up a toolbar that allows you to use your fingers to create a new polygon, things like those. The problem is what do you do with the data when you finish your survey? You have kind of to bring it into your GIS. There is a plugin for QGIS and for GRASS to do so, but I think it's quite a bit outdated. So what we do, we brought into open source the tool we use internally in our, uh, in our company. So this is called Stage. You can download it at that URL. And there is also a video at this other URL where I show how to simply convert your Joe Paparazzi project into GIS data. So, this shows also the, the module is called Geo Paparazzi 4 Converter. There is also one for Geo Paparazzi 3 because the format has changed a bit. And once you convert this data, you will get a shapefile of points, which also will import all the data in your complex forms. You will get a shapefile of points with references to all the pictures you've taken. The pictures will be put inside a folder where the data are exported. There will be shapefile of your log lines and points. And another thing that is created for each log, the profile chart, images of the profiles are created. So that you can have a very quick look, uh, even, if you don't, uh, even without opening open office or something like that. And you can have a look at what you did. 
What about the other way around? What if I need to visualize some background data? We have a module called Jopabrati Maps Creator where you can very simply insert shape files and rasters, tell, create me an MBTIES database for Jopabrati visualization on a certain area, and you launch it and it will produce you this MBTIES database. You move it onto Paparazzi and you can just use it. These are really, really simple tools to use. Uh, I would like to spend a couple of last words, I'm already done, about projects based on Paparazzi. I'm very happy to see, actually, that in Japan, Paparazzi is way more used than in Italy. I would <laughs> prefer to also have some people use it in Italy, but actually it has been done because there are some projects also in Italy. But I don't think it's so used as here. Which so thank you. And some projects, for example, is one is the you should know a disaster management information system. The screenshots are a bit outdated, sorry. <laughs> the the interface has been improved. Then we made a project for a university where in the background, Jeff Paparazzi was used to gain uh, gas emissions. They were going with a tool which was connected in Bluetooth to the tablet, and you could chart and have a look if there are gas problems. We also created something based on Jeff Paparazzi. As you can see, it's very similar. It's called Smart Manhole. In Italy, they started to um, put the, the manholes under the road, so when they have to find them again to do some works, they sometimes have to open up half of the road because they don't know exactly where it was. And so we made an application where you can find through RFID tags, you know those small tags that are in the cart, you put it on the smart manholes, on the manholes, and you can find it with this nice tool you can see there. And the last project we did with another open source company, it's called Trackoid, and it's an application to do tracking of fleets or rescue, to support rescue missions in the mountains. So you, this is a real-time tracking based on Joe Paparazzi, where you can really see you have five devices going around the mountain. If the connection works, you will see it on your web application in real time. So you can send SMS to the people to tell to change the, the way or look in another position. So there are a part of the internet also a GMS communication if the internet fails. So I think this is all about my presentation. And I leave you here with some links to the mailing list if you have questions or if you have problems. And some other links about the website of Joe Paparazzi and the trans effects. Uh, I mean, Joe Paparazzi is uh, already very, very translated in, in Japan, in Japanese, so I don't think we will need somebody to go on that page. But, anyways, I leave you to that. I leave you also in the whole first part, I showed a couple of statistics. Uh, these are the links. Uh, as reference where I took the information, just that I didn't take them, th think or invented them. So I'm very happy <laughs> to say that the next presentation will also be on Joe Paparazzi, so I will leave the space <laughs> to Hayashi Sub. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have I been so clear? え、面白かった。えっと、あの、ツールの中でステージというツールを最後紹介されたと思います。で、あの、オーライマップを作るツールとしては、あの、結構有用なものになるかなと思ってます。で、え、次は私の発表ですが、<笑><笑><笑><